Hey, Strategic Social Media class, welcome to the lecture today. I'm late, as you can see again. I'm really sorry about that. Uh, it's harder to get stuff done at home than I really thought it would be. I mean, I have four kids at home and they are great, but they make things tough sometimes. So sorry, not trying to complain to you. Uh, just, I've gotten a few emails about deadlines and worry about that. You know, do your best to meet the deadlines. I mean, you have definitely have to meet the deadline by the end of the semester, but you know, we're all in a crazy situation here. So I'm going to be as understanding, as flexible as I can be. With that in mind, I really loved reading your discussion board posts and I like to see that almost everyone replied. So that was great. Um, some of the conversations that you picked were really interesting. I love the Chrissy Teigen one. Um, I, like I told the person who posted this, I haven't followed The Bachelor in a while, but that was an interesting one to see that one of The Bachelors has COVID-19. Um, it was interesting to see that post about students looking for tuition refunds because classes are going online. Um, you know, even as a teacher, I probably shouldn't put this in public so where somebody can use it against me. But, you know, I kind of agree. I mean, it's, you know, we're trying to keep classes the same, but it is a little different, you know. Um, I, I don't mind teaching online, but I really like the in-person experience better. And so I get why students are upset about that. Good for you. Um, again, I almost didn't, I almost hesitated to give you another discussion board assignment just because you did such a great job with this. And honestly, a lot of what you posted for the last discussion board assignment could be applied to this one, but I tried to keep the new one really short and you'll get details about that at the end of the video. Um, I also have in the other video some feedback on your analytics assignment. I have all of those graded. Um, if you're not seeing your grade, um, I, I, well, I have them all graded, but I haven't put them all on Blackboard yet, but I will do that by the end of the day today. So if you don't see your grade on there, um, just give it a couple, just give it a little bit of a little time and you'll see it on there. Um, other than that, I don't have anything else. Um, I'm always here if you have questions or comments. Um, please, please feel free to contact me by email or you can call my office phone and I'm getting those voicemails at home here. Um, so thanks and now on to the class lecture. Before we jump into our discussion about great content that leads to making connections with your audience, I wanted to spend a little bit of time going over your analytics assignments. Um, I really enjoyed them. I thought you did a really good job with them overall. Uh, I was really impressed with the amount of data that you were able to collect using the free tools that we talked about in class. There were a couple of overall points that I wanted to make. Um, if you were to have to do this assignment in the future or if you were doing this for a client, these are some of the things I, I would look at. First off, when you talk about the audience that you're going for, I mean, really think about those sneezers and those influencers. Be specific. You know, go back to that in-class assignment we did of creating the ideal audience profile and thinking about that person and how we can reach those and identify those. Um, a lot of times when you guys did identify influencers, you identified influencers who were already within the company. Um, like, for example, with WOUB, you know, a lot of their influencers were people who were posting or part of their shows like Hardwood Heroes. We got to go beyond and find, you know, is there that one parent that's on their social accounts that we can really capitalize and use them to build our message. Second, uh, everyone talked about how there needs to be more engagement, um, but I didn't see enough information on how to get that kind of engagement. What are the analytics suggesting to you are these are posts that get more comments or that get uh, that people spend more time with or um, these are accounts where we're seeing more of a return okay there's also a couple of you identified that posts were different the top posts were different on each accounts um, but you didn't really explain why and I think that's kind of the challenge with an assignment like this when you're going through analytics analytics is the is the key phrase so that doesn't just mean looking at the data, that means you have to provide your expertise and analyze them, them a little bit. And all that analysis should be powered by the data that you're getting from the analytics. So remember, analytics is not just, here's the numbers. There has to be some instruction on what to do with those numbers or what do those numbers mean. So for example, one of your teams looked at like the post time, but again, they have to decide, okay, so why are posts being made at these times? And are there more effective times that posts could have been made to reach the core audience, which in this case would have been college students, to reach them more effectively. 
um, when we're looking at the hashtags, you know, there's a lot of information about like what hashtags are being used, but I would even go a little bit further and say, why are these the hashtags? Are there sustaining conversations that are already going on with these hashtags? And why are these effective? Why are these keep showing up in our analytics? There was a lot of times too where you noted discrepancies. One of the key ones that I saw was, you know, more female posters than men. So talk about that. Why is that happening? Give us a little bit of your expert analysis based on the data um, about why that might be. A lot of the analytics will point to which accounts or which social media platforms, or to use the parlance of our textbook, which channels are more effective. And I would have liked to have seen a little bit of that in your analysis reports as well. Um, a couple of you even said, oh, they should go on these other accounts. But I think the, the data needs to support a need to go on those accounts before I would launch into something like that. Um, so if you say, okay, here's our ideal audience, and we're seeing the data as pointed that this ideal audience is on this social media platform, that would give me a compelling reason to go to that platform. Okay. But the biggest thing is, again, I think you did well, just use analytics, use the data to drive strategy. Um, not Don't just present the data in itself. All right, so let's jump now into content. Okay, one of the key points and one of the key definitions that Clampett gives of content um, um, is this one. I guess it's not really a definition, but it's a it's a rule of thumb to think about with your content. Like he says here, if your content fails to resonate, your entire social media strategy will collapse in a heap of good intentions. So not just your, you know, the content itself, but your strategy. And I'm glad that he brings those two things in together because strategy needs to drive content. He also tries to break it down. And, you know, I mean, this is a difficult decision. Even as I was putting this together again, I kept thinking, you know, well, what is there a criteria for this is great content? And I, there's some suggestions here that I'll share with you later. But, you know, a lot of the a lot of good content just passes the eye test, right? This is good content. You know, I know it when I see it. And I think we all know it when we see it. And I think sometimes it's hard to put our finger on it. Um, but that's something that we have to try to do if we're using content strategically. Okay. So first off, the question he asks are, what are your content options? Um, and these are all things that should be part of your strategy. Okay. Who generates the content? And then how do I select the right content? One of the reasons why throughout the semester I've been emphasizing the content strategies that he talks about because these are all key ways to answer these questions. Okay, He also makes a really interesting distinction when we're talking about content between two different types, form and type. And those words seem like they mean the same thing. But when you look at them, um, they really don't. And they're two distinct things that I think we need to look at as we propose content for social media. So first off, form is the shape and structure of an object. Okay, and these are defini definitions I just took from the dictionary, but I did them strategically <laughs> to try to kind of help you see the difference between form and type. Okay, uh, form also is the way in which a thing exists, acts, or manifests itself. So in terms of social media, form is the words we put on the screen, the photos that we shoot. Um, these are the things that shape or structure the message that we're doing. And then when we look at the type, type from the dictionary is an example or model having the ideal features of a group or class, an embodiment. So what does this mean for us? This means that the type of content means we select the right forms for the right platforms or for the right media. In other words, if we're looking at Instagram, we want our form to be great pictures with good detail and lots of emotion in them. Um, but then the type is that's what we use on Instagram. Maybe we use a different type for Facebook or type for a different social media platform. I asked the question here and I, we would talk about it in class if we had time um, or if we were in class. Um, is this an oversimplification of the way of looking at content? I mean, there's lots of different things that go into content. As we already talked about, there's lots of different things that specify to us what great content is. Uh, so yeah, I guess I do think this is an oversimplification, but I don't think that if we get into the minutia of this is what great content is, I think we lose sight of it. You know, 
Great content's not always something that we say, okay, we can check off all these boxes and that's what makes it great. If we think about form, if we think about type, then maybe we'll find those synergies or those happy surprises that lead to great content that we wouldn't have thought about if we were just checking off boxes. The other thing to think about with content too, and I call it the sweet spot, I think Clampett calls it that as well, is it's not just the content that we create. I think we saw um, in that discussion board that we just went through, um, you know, how much that what our audience gives us enhances what we do. So that's why we need to think beyond organizational control. We're not just creating content. We want to create things that resonate with our audience and they can use to help us to expand our message and to build upon what we're doing. Um, and that's really what the purposes of user control is. I mean, when we're talking about engagement, we're talking about brand affinity, uh, we're talking about um, building you know, fans and followers and friends even you know, that we can have conversations with. Um, that's the purpose that user control serves. So see, sometimes allowing the audience to feel like they have control will really help them to engage with us more. And I think it's something that I always encourage uh, people that I work with to think about and even to try a little bit. So if we're looking at, if we're looking at the, sorry, well, that was weird. Um, if we're looking at what makes great content, then these are what Clampett's definition is. And again, they're not an exact definition. There's a lot of synergies and things that we might not see. But here's some really interesting um, options that he provides. First off, great content has to be feedback driven. We have to know it's great because our audience is telling us it's great. It has to be coordinate aligned. Remember, coordinates are our, our specific goals and targets that we're shooting for as part of our strategy. So our content needs to be helping us achieve that. A lot of times content can be the specific things to getting us to those goals. You know, if we, if our goal is we want a hundred more followers, then we need to be creating content that leads people to following us. Okay. Um, it's sensitive to the audience. Uh, you know, not just the audience in general, but specific parts of the audience. You know, our tone needs to match our audience um, and needs to match it in several different ways. Okay. Um, category apportioned. This was a really interesting way that he describes it. But, you know, they just need to match other parts of the segment, other things that people are doing. Um, you know, Wendy's, I think, has been so successful in a lot of what they're doing because they are category appropriate. You know, we don't think of fast food and think of, uh, you know, a candlelight dinner or, you know, the seriousness of a uh, Wagner opera or something like that. I mean, we think, you know, fast, fun, casual, right? I mean, that's all part of the definition. So that's why it works. You know, maybe um, a very smart way of looking at it wouldn't work. Uh, and then finally, it has to be channel compatible, it has to work with the social platform that you're using it on. I get a lot of questions about the feedback driven element that he asks, um, that he adds to the definition. And so that's why I kind of came up with this. And it's just going back to what we're talking about again. You know, how do we know feedback? Uh, a lot of times you just have to ask for it. Um, it's okay to say, you know, hey, do you like this post? Or, and if you're good at creating those calls to action that have those specific criteria that we talked about, that they're clear, concise, specific, and actionable. Um, you'll get feedback on whether your content is effective or not. And I just had to throw up some other really good examples of calls to action that I've seen. Um, you know, first off, I mean, I'm a kind of a, I don't want to say I'm a fan. I don't watch every one of his videos, but I appreciate what Philip DeFranco does. And you can just see here on the, um, what do they call this? Not a bumper, maybe? That's a new radio term. But anyway, you know, this last part of his YouTube video, how he really solicits a lot of feedback from his audience. Um, you know, uh, this is a, a post a little while ago when Nick Kristoff, a journalist that I follow uh, for the New York Times, um, I, he works for the New York Times. I don't follow him for the Times. Um, but, you know, he's really good at when he does a chat with someone, making sure that he asks his audience. Um, so he provides in this tweet or this Facebook post, he's providing some really good background. Um, and then he's going to that clear, concise, direct action. Send us your questions. 
All right, and finally, this is just a site that I like for board game stuff. Um, and I love how at the end of the, each of their posts, they take the topic of the post and turn it into a question. So what's your gi favorite giant stompy robot? Let us know in the comments. I've answered a lot of these dumb things. Um, one thing I wish they're not very good at replying to comments. Uh, so I'd like to hear more from them. But I just, a, a call to action like this, you know, it, it's like the great classic comic book discussion of all time, right? You know, um, would Superman beat Captain America or something like that? You know, if you're a nerd, you want to weigh in. And that's kind of the same thing here. All right. So you guys already posted some examples of really good content in your interactive conversations. Um, I really enjoyed reading those and checking out some of those posts. That's a part of the reason why I'm late tonight, um, today. It's not even tonight yet. Today. Um, but I had a couple more examples that we could that I kind of wanted to analyze based on the criteria that we just talked about for you. So you to kind of help you solidify these concepts in your mind a little bit. Okay. So remember, let's look at the we're going to look at the form and type. We're going to remember the key criteria that Clampett put out there, um, and we're going to just see what kind of audience reaction was it. So this was a post that I just pulled out um, from Twitter today. Uh, I follow a number of academic threads and. You know, I guess I pulled this one out and I think it's great content because it really answers a question that I have or really addresses a concern that I have. Um, which, as she says here, you know, what is, how productive should I be in this time? Um, you know, this is something I, that I've debated that I think maybe you guys have too. You know, a lot of, as an example, I mean, I spent my morning today doing my kids homework it felt like I didn't get to my homework that I where I should have and part of me feels guilty and feels like I should have spent more time but this is also a really weird time right and I that's why I think this was great it's short it's sweet um, it could have asked a more specific question um, of the audience but it really encouraged them to talk about it and led to some really good advice in the end um, here's just some more examples of posts and I really think you know I had to as part of this thing because I saved um, her reply, I wish she would have replied a little bit more, but you know, her just by saying sad truth, I think works. And then I took this from USA Today. Um, this is a great photo, you know, well composed, uh, great foreground shot, tells a story all by itself. And so to me, you know, at first glance, I'm like, that's great content because that's a great photo. But then as I went through the replies to this Instagram post, I realized um, that just this is an example of what. Clampett is talking about that if your content isn't great, it can derail your whole strategy. Because look what happened to the discussion. Um, and there were a bunch of these posts here. It got hijacked. People were selling it to encourage people to invest in some probably pyramid scheme or scam or you know some Bitcoin mining kind of thing. And I think to me that really hurt the content here. Um, still a great photo, but because it doesn't have that follow-up that it needed. I think it lost a lot of its effectiveness. We also read the chapter about connections, and I wanted to make a brief comment about connections. Um, I liked what, I mean, I, I included this question on the quiz, and I had to include a, another comic book image here. That's Bullseye from Daredevil. You know, why are we talking about Bullseye notes? What is this important? Um, why is this important? And I think the key is, you know, the Bullseye note actually tips you off that your strategy is working, that it's reaching. You know, that's why you really need to focus in and try some of these things. I mean, a lot of like what Clampett says is trial and error, but when you see that something is working and hitting that bullseye that you've set, that means you're kind of working, all right? Um, I mentioned links here too, because one of the foundational principles of the internet, one of the things that really made it work from the beginning, and I think this is what works in social media as well, is, Linking and linking as much as possible and uh, preserving what the internet itself calls the link economy, which is the more times I link to you, the more potential I have to type tap into your audience. Um, that's one of the reasons why I always encourage students whenever they use an image or music to give credit to that person because it creates a link. I think we can do this in social media as well. You know, use more tags, use more handles for people, create those links to really create some lasting connections. Okay. And then he talks about, you know, what do we want our connections to do? 
Do we want them centralized, decentralized, or distributed? And there's not a right answer to this. I mean, sometimes you want them centralized, sometimes you want them decentralized, sometimes you want them distributed. So look, here's an example of each of those. A centralized connection basically uses us as the key source. Um, so this, to me, it seems like maybe a journalist would want a centralized connection. People are coming to him for the news. With a decentralized connection, um, maybe this is just you're a thought leader, but you want to encourage people to have a discussion about it. So maybe people start with you, but then they go to other thought leaders, and they're still connected to you, um, but there's more conversations going on around them. And then the distributed connection, and it says least vulnerable to attack, because this is actually a description of, um, of network nodes on the internet, but I think it actually works too for people connections, because in a distributed environment, you're not the, the key source. Um, there aren't really opinion leaders, uh, but they're all connected in such a way. And I see this happening a lot with some of the COVID-19 reporting, where people are sharing their opinions, but deferring to someone else, um, or, you know, maybe even like bringing in this, the central information from like the Ohio Health Department, but then talking about their personal experience as it goes through. Um, and I think that's a really good thing of how we distribute the information um, to build a network. And it, sometimes the distributed connections um, are the stronger connections. I mean, as you can see there in the diagram. Um, so sometimes it's not necessary to think we're the only source for this type of information or this brand that we're working on. Um, sometimes it's better to distribute that across your network. That's another reason why the calls to action um, and the links and the other things that you can do are really helpful to you rather than hurting you. But the key thing is, you know, connection trumps number every time. If you connect to the right people, that's better than connecting to lots and lots and lots of people. And I think this is, comes clear when you look at Clampett's connections matrix here. Um, you know, remember depth, abundance, simplicity, and reach, these are all content strategies that he talked about. Um, so, you know, where do you fall on this? And I think you can even use this matrix with an individual post. Where do you want this post to fall on the matrix? Um, is this a depth post, a simplicity post? Um, is this reach, abundance? Now, you know, why is that 150 there in the middle? If you remember what Clampett talks about, 150, um, and I had to look this up to make sure I said it right, this is um, the Dunbar number, okay? This basically means that we're only able to maintain about 150 relationships at any one time. Um, and so when you think about it, you know, and we're trying, we're going for these huge numbers, it's going to be hard to maintain that, um, so that's why a lot of times it's good to think of our connections in more distributed or decentralized ways. Um, if we can have 150 really great followers that will share our message for us, that's better than having a million that we can barely sustain ourselves. There's one interesting thing that I would have brought out in class too, um, and I thought about making you read this, but um, I'm not. Um, Clay Shirky is a really influential thinker about the internet. And he talks a lot in his book, um, Here Comes Everybody, which is all about the power of decentralized networks um, and how basically the audience knows more than you do and you should tap into them. He says really the nature of celebrity is about inaccessibility. You know, um, Lady Gaga, that's the only celebrity I can think of for some reason right now, um, you know, she can maintain that because I can't have access to her. Well, how does social media kind of mess that up, right? It makes me think that, or, you know, like you guys uh, in your discussion board post, you know, Chrissy Teigen, she's obviously a celebrity, but she has this real hominess. You know, she offers to make a guy banana bread. It makes me think that I can be connected to her. And so it's changing the definition of celebrity right now. Um, but it's still, I really don't have a connection to her. I just feel like I do. Um, and that, Shirky is saying, is probably even more important than actually having that connection. But really, in the end, it's what you want, what you, th you decide is most important for your strategy. All right, I hope this helped to understand the, the chapters. If you have any questions about it, let me know. Um, I did have a really brief discussion board assignment, and I know you're working on another assignment, so 
I hope this doesn't take a ton of your time, but I do want to give you some credit for sitting through this boring lecture. So go on the discussion board and post a link to a, just a single piece of great content. Don't look at the discussion that's going on. You know, don't look at other replies to this. Just something that you think is really great. Make sure you post a link and then in your own words, explain why. You can use some of the concepts that the chapter talks about. Um, that would be great. Uh, but really what I'm most interested in is your opinion here. Why you think this is great. Um, and then look through your classmates' post and just make another brief comment on um, two of your other classmates' posts. Either agreeing with them or politely and respectfully disagreeing with them. That's okay too, as long as we're polite and, and respectful. Okay. Next week, we will have more on content. Um, specifically, we're going to focus in on social video and talk about some of the conventions of that to prepare you for the next assignment that will be due a week from tomorrow, um, which is creating a social video. Um, we'll do another discussion board post on Tuesday, but probably not one on Thursday to give you more time to work on your videos. Um, if you haven't completed your Hootsuite certifications, um, including you know the first one and the one that's due this week, um, make sure you do that. And I mean, I should have it by the end of this week, but I'm still working on catching up with grades with your social, um, your uh, your classroom presentations that are online. And so I'm going to I'm going to work really hard over the weekend and getting all that up so that you know how you're doing in this class. Um, I really appreciate you guys. I appreciate how difficult the situation is and you know how challenging it is. So keep in touch and I'm doing my best to make sure you get a lot out of this class still. All right. Thanks. Have a great week.